Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is J.D. Vance, Presidential Pick. Uh, J.D. Vance, who, as we all know, was the selection of Donald Trump to become the next vice president, should he be elected in November. And uh, so what's the history of J.D. Vance? He comes from Ohio. He is elected as senator of Ohio. And he wrote a book about um, disenfranchisement of Americans in the Midwest. Uh, quite a popular book. Uh, but the most important thing about, to know about J.D. Vance is his supporter. And that is a venture capitalist by the name of Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel has been a longtime uh, venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Valley. He uh, tapped the shoulder of J.D. Vance uh, as soon as he graduated from Yale College. And he, he is his mentor. And that mentorship uh, follows into place as far as financial support of $10 million during the senatorial election in Ohio. That was a campaign donation. And now he has uh, tugged on the ear of Donald Trump to say, this is who your vice president selection should be. And it did happen. Uh, what is the motivation for Peter Thiel to have J.D. Vance become the vice president? Well, we're going to discuss that right now in this show. And with me is my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, Jay. Morning, Tim. Hey, Jay, you know, um, Peter Thiel, a big shot, a billionaire big shot in Silicon Valley, is uh, turning the gears to get other, other uh, Silicon Valley billionaires to support the Trump ticket. Um, comes to mind is uh, Elon Musk with a contribution of $45 million a month. Uh, towards the Trump campaign. And there seems to be a high desire to make sure that uh, J.D. Vance is part of that ticket. Uh, your thoughts about the selection of AD, J.D. Vance and uh, Silicon Valley to try to get behind them? Are they the new oligarchs of this country? No, I think it was their choice, not Trump's. He, he, he went along with it because it would help him to have friends like that. Um, but I don't think that was the best pick, and I think he knows it now, and he's distancing himself from J.D. Vance. And uh, the press is giving J.D. Vance a kind of a black eye on a number of things. Um, and that, that's worthy, because he deserves a black eye on a number of things. Anyway, what I, what I find this to be is transactional. Just like Trump tried to do a transaction with uh, Zelensky uh, back in, what, 2016 or 2017. Um, he was um, trying to ingratiate himself um, by making a quid, remember that term, quid pro quo, uh, with Zelensky. So uh, they play with him, he plays with them. And what are they playing for? They're playing for power, they're playing for money. I think with Trump, it's, it's both. Anyway, yes, I agree with your use of the term oligarchs. I think uh, these guys want to be oligarchs, just like in Russia. Just like in Putin, they want to be incredibly wealthy. They don't have enough money yet, you understand. And, and they want to uh, engage in this um, transactional thing with Trump. They give money. Elon Musk is disgusting. Uh, they give money, and um, they get him and power and more money. This reminds me, actually, Tim, of the robber barons of the turn of the 20th century, where you had robber barons engaging in antitrust activities. And that's what this is. Um, it's Peter Thiel, it's uh, Elon Musk, and it's others, other tech guys who are billionaires. Um, and I, and I, it's really disgusting because this is a trust arrangement. This is something that antitrust concepts should apply mm -hmm. to. And what I think also is, is, is offensive is that they, in large part, are using the system, the system that allowed them to get so wealthy against the country. The very system, the very democracy that allowed them to get wealthy, they're trying to bring down. And it's, um, you know, it's just awful. It's shocking. It's unconscionable. You know, it's outrageous. You know, this blatant uh, pandering for money, um, I'm reminded of a speech I saw Donald Trump in one of his campaign rallies. Uh, it was a fundraiser. And he was speaking before the oil executives in that room. And he just blatantly said, you know, if you give me your money, I'm going to ensure that uh, the oil industries could be taken very care of uh, during my administration. Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a, pro, a quid pro quo. Give me your money and I'll ensure that legislation will benefit the oil industry. Uh, is we bordering on some kind of uh, malfeasance or, um, 
illegality as far as um, money pay to play? I know well, Citizens exactly United. You know, I know Citizens United has uh, you know greatly diminished that line and made it very murky. But uh, some of this stuff looks horribly blatant. Your thoughts? No, remember Zelensky and the quid pro quo. That was pay to play. You know, I'll give you, what is it, 400, 500 million dollars, which Congress already appropriated. Um, only if you do me this political favor, which will help me get elected. It was pretty gross. And that's exactly what's happening now. It's revealed. You know, we know the outlines. Uh, Citizens United or not, you can't buy votes. You can't buy power. You can't trade power for money. And that's what he's doing in plain view. The other thing is that uh, this is all around Project 25. Um, he may be distancing himself from that, but his oligarchy is not. Um, they want those points. They want that platform. And they are giving him money so that he adopts those platform points. Um, as I said before, maybe they're not rich enough. I just find it incredible that anybody be so greedy as to give $45 million a month um, so he can have more power, more money, more access um, to the Oval Office. Um, but that's exactly what we see here. It's pay to play. And it's also it's a, it's a, it's a culture point, Tim, in the tech industry. You know, in the tech industry, as it has evolved, the general notion of the guys on top is screw the public, ignore the government, make oodles of money, no limit of money, um, get your stockholders and directors on board with you for those points, uh, avoid any responsibility, avoid any accountability. Um, and that's what they're doing here. They're screwing the country to make more money. And this is a serious cultural problem in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, you probably wondered over the past 20, 30 years how somebody could be so wealthy um, doing tech. Well, it's not just the wealth. It's what goes with the wealth. Absolute wealth creates, uh, you know, absolute power, which corrupts. And that's what's happened right. to the tech industry. You know, um, one of Peter Thiel's partners, uh, one of the, you know, many billion dollar f uh, funders, founding f uh, funders um, accounts, said the following, we have a former tech venture capitalist in the White House, and that's great for the country and great for Earth. Um, you know, the tech companies of, you know, t in 2016, weren't it overly impressed, and this includes Peter Thiel, was, weren't overly impressed with the administration and what they did. Uh, yes, they got a corporate tax cut uh, of substantial size, but other than that, uh, they saw regulatory intervention on, you know, especially uh, emerging new companies as cumbersome, as, um, as an inconvenience. And so uh, the tech companies of Silicon Valley didn't really get involved in the first administration uh, with Donald Trump, but they are now because they see J.D. Vance as the one to whisper in Donald Trump's ear to say, let's remove any kind of regulations or corporate uh, barriers for our new startup companies to do as they wish, as they wish, when they wish. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a gold mine. And, and I, you know, where, where is the morality? The tech industry has changed, you know, Tim. You know, we, we at Think Tech have been using tech from many, many sources. We have, I counted them once, we have 70 applications we use to make it happen. And we've been following those applications and those companies for 25 years. And I'm here to tell you, they have changed. You can't reach them on the phone. They don't care about whether you like it or not. They're going to renew against your wishes and charge you again and again. And they buy off the credit card companies. They buy off PayPal. You can't dispute it effectively. And so what happens is a gold mine, whether they're rendering value to you or not, it's changed. And these guys are sort of an example of that change that attitudinal change. So what do you do to stop them? You know, Teddy Roosevelt saw this clearly. He saw they were in, engaged in monopoly and conspiratorial trust arrangements, and he, he implemented his trust busting in the early part of the 20th century. And um, I think when Biden and now Harris say they're gonna go for the, the wealthy guys and the 1% and all that, 
In large part, they're talking about these very same people, the billionaires who have no sense of responsibility. They never went to civics. They don't care about democracy. They don't care about the, the, the public or their customers. And that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about this? This is a serious problem because if he's elected, he will owe them big time. He, he will make them oligarchs if they are, aren't already oligarchs. And he will do mm, transactional arrangements with them to make them richer and more powerful and dump on everyone else. We have to stop this. It's a serious problem in his platform for us. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you mentioned um, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, remember, uh, he wasn't the pick that the robber barons wanted. They, they, had, their, they had bought and paid McKinley uh, to do their bidding. And it was only through an assassin's bullet that Teddy Roosevelt became the president. And he was the anti, uh, he was the trust buster, and they knew that. And so these, these folks weren't too happy when McKinley was assassinated. And um, Teddy, the rest is history, as they say. Teddy Roosevelt basically broke up all these mega monopolies. And um, I think that uh, Peter Thiel has his hopes in J.D. Vance to be the next McKinley, as that is to run free and loose with... Um, all tech issues, and, and what are those tech issues? Um, what are the big issues? I, I'm thinking two things. One, finally Congress is starting to crack down on social media. Finally Congress is starting to look at the impact of technology as far as communications in social media. And most importantly, on the horizon is the, the technological use of AI. Well, you certainly don't want any regulatory things getting in the way of uh, that development, and so this is a critical, as you say, an inflection point on where technology goes as we move forward and uh, forward, and certainly how the administration, the Trump administration, will give a, a, a green light and um, the checkered flag to do for technology to do as it pleases. Yeah, and Peter Thiel and his friends control Vance. So, um, you know, fact is that uh, Trump is uh, getting old and uh, he's failing and it's, it's clear to see that his mind doesn't work the way it used to. I'm not sure it ever worked correctly. Um, and and what, what's going to happen is he's going to get weak, he's going to get frail, he's going to die or get sick or be unable to perform the, any duties of the office of president. And then what do you have? You have J.D. Vance. Now, Teal controls Vance, and the others in the conspiracy control Vance. Uh, so they're going to have not, what they want, not only through Trump, but maybe even worse through Vance. We're talking about oligarchy. We're talking about fascism is what we're talking about. A, a line of two of them already we know about. Um, and I think Teal will do that. Teal, that's why Teal and his friends selected Vance. They want Vance, the young man, to outlive uh, Trump, and they want to control him completely. And this is the point of the control. They will do what he wants. And uh, I'm sorry, he will do what they want. And mm -hmm. there'll be an insidious connection uh, in power and in government. And, you know, I think also you have to take into account that Trump will be much more powerful than he was last time. Uh, he will, you know, be a dictator on day one. He won't have to vote again. We'll have discussions of that here on Think Tech. Bottom line is that, um, you know, he will have more power and Vince as his successor will have more power, and, and that's what they want. They want to wreck the country, I'm sorry. I think it's really terrible that these guys who have benefited by the democracy, who have had businesses that flourished in the democracy, would take steps like this to bring the democracy down. And again, the question is, what do we do about it? Because it's visible now. You can see the outlines with Trump and with Vance. Well, what you do about it is vote. Um... You know, J.D. Vance has had a problematic two weeks, particularly regarding his previous comments uh, about single women and cat, cat ladies and being single, and they shouldn't have the same equal vote as uh, women with, with families, <laughs> with children. Um, he doubled down on that, by the way, and that didn't really uh, endear him to uh, women, period, or men. Uh, it seemed to be highly discriminatory. And... Um, back to the days where Donald Trump wants to make America great again, which is to say women don't count. Uh, so I'm sure that Peter Thiel did not anticipate this kind of backlash uh, on their boy wonder, Mr. Vance. 
Uh, Donald Trump, as of this morning, was uh, on a panel of a convention of black journalists. And he said explicitly that uh, the vice president really has no impact or no weight on an election. And he said quite, he said quite uh, blatantly, when you vote, you vote for me and that's it. So he really kind of diminished the, the influence or the power of his new selection of J.D. Vance. Um, do you think Trump is at a position where he wants to moonwalk away from Vance because of his, uh, his past is starting to catch up with him? Oh, yeah. I think, I think that's been suggested for the past few days. Uh, Kamala is a real big threat to, to Trump, and uh, Vance is not a help. Um, but I, I'd like to add to what you said. It, it, uh, also, Trump, in this panel with the black journalists, uh, said that um, he, he believed that uh, Harris was um, um, not really a black person. She was not really in the black community, I guess. And um, I think I think he, he he said she's really Indian, not black. And and I and I, that reminds me so much of what he did with Barack Obama, saying that Barack Obama wasn't born here, was not legitimate. And that's exactly what he's doing now. It's racist. And he made a point of it in that panel. And I think we're going to hear more of it. And I, you know, I think that he's just trying to make outrageous statements to get back to the news cycle because he lost the news cycle over the over the past week. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, but I, well, I think it does because it's a problem. Uh, it does because we all know and we saw it in 2016, 17 uh, through his entire administration is no news is bad news as long as my name's on it and it's spelled correctly. Uh, and that is his philosophy. So I think uh, although the statement he made at the uh, the convention of black journalists was outrageous, and I think it's going to turn off a lot of would-be black voters or young people, um, he just shot his toes off in that respect. But I guarantee you this, these outrageous comments will shift away uh, some of the media attention from Harris uh, over back to, to the Trump camp. Uh, I'm not sure that's... Uh, politically astute, but that's Donald Trump's modus operandi and has been for for eight years. And I'm not sure that's going to win him more votes, but uh, he will get the media back on his side for, for at least temporarily. I agree. It, this is a news cycle battle. You know, he lost it for a week and now he's trying to get it back. He understands, as he did when he was in real estate, um, calling and impersonating people in the real estate industry, calling and trying to get himself in the paper. Um, he's always done that, and he's doing it now. He realizes he needs to get back to the top of the news cycle. And she, at least the press, is telling her, hey, you know, you've had a great time. You've had a great honeymoon for the past week, but you have got to stay at the top of the news cycle because he is trying to bring you down from the news cycle. He's making outrageous uh, statements. And so, you know, if I were talking to her, I would say, you have to answer every one of them. You have to call them out on everything. It's not just the debate where she says, tell it to my tell it to my face. It's everything he says. She can't let him get away with it. And it's not a matter of putting you know millions of dollars of uh, TV ads on. It's a matter of uh, making press releases and comments and getting on the talk shows and saying he lied. He lied about me just the same way he lied about Obama. Have you heard that before? He's a real bum. Yeah, um, and she's got to respond to that. And, and when she does that, it's free. It's free press. And that's what she's got to do, just like yeah. that. I believe that. I, I've always said that you never leave a room with someone making a comment about you and uh, you don't respond to it because the audience these days, maybe not in the past, but in these days, may actually accept that last comment as, well, you didn't defend it, so therefore maybe it's true. Um, now, this is in great opposition to Michelle Obama's uh, comment, infamous comment, when they go low, we go high. Well, I don't think campaigns are run that way anymore. Uh, yeah, do you focus on the, the positive, on what your administration wants to do as far as policy, policy initiatives? Sure. But if you ignore the criticisms and the, and the things that Donald Trump says and, and just ignore them, uh, he wins. And that's not the way it used to be where you don't lower yourself to someone's uh, low standards, but 
I, I'm of the mind that sometimes you do have to address them and take them on one at a time, just as you just suggested. I would change Michelle Obama's uh, you know, statement uh, these days to something a little different. Uh, when they lie, uh, we go honest. Ah. And that's what Kamala has to do. She has to call them out on all those lies. She has to tell the truth. There was an article in the paper this morning um, suggesting that she is actually doing that. She is going to call them out. If, if he insults her, she will respond. It's not a matter of going low or going high. It's a matter of calling him out with lies. And I think, I think that's going to happen here. And I think she's got the moxie for it. I like her. I watched her on uh, cable last night, and I was very impressed with the way she spoke to people, her general attitude. Um, what a refreshing, what a refreshing personality she has compared to him, the, the messenger of doom. Um, and I, you know, I, I sent her money right away. That's how I felt about it, and I think a lot of people did. That's good. Uh, well, we'll see if, if if your prediction comes true. She has a campaign stop here shortly. And we, we'll see if once she's on the stage, whether she takes on Donald Trump's initial comments about her. Uh, I, I thought it was deplorable. I heard it live and I thought, you know, basically what he said is uh, she's always uh, identified with Indian, East Indian. And now she's not. Suddenly she's black. And I couldn't believe that. that well, I could believe it, that it came out of his mouth. I just couldn't believe that he was so stupid to say it in front of a black audience of journalists. And uh, again, the price you pay to get the news cycle back in your camp uh, is a high price to pay him in this particular situation, I think. I think this one's going to haunt him for a while. He's going to do more of it, though. It's his playbook. He's going to yeah. make outrageous comments. Or will he backtrack and say, that's not what I meant? Or, or will he backtrack and say, I was just kidding? Or will his surrogates say he was kidding, he wasn't serious? Because that's the usual pattern that we see when Donald Trump makes some really blunders, verbal blunders. He's asking for her if he does that. Because, you know, if I was advising her, I would tell him, I would tell her uh, to call him out on that. That's what he did before. That's what he's always done. And you really have to believe it when he when he makes these uh, uh, racial comments and epithets and shows his bigotry and whatnot. When he says he's going to be a dictator, when he says he's going to ignore the Constitution, when he says he don't have to vote again, those are serious statements. You can't back away. And he endorsed Project 2025. You can't back away. It's on the record. This is all on the record. And she has to call him out. Uh, for backtracking and showing that he lied. You know, it's the old question in court, Tim. Uh, were you lying then or are you lying now? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, well, in this case, it's true. <laughs> There's no option. There's no other option. It's just answer the question. <laughs> um, you know, this may be a 30,000 foot question here. And um, we've had many discussions in the last five years about what a second Trump administration might look like. Um, you and I have talked about predictions, and we think they're more than predictions. We think it's actually what's going to happen. Uh, what does a Trump administration look like if Silicon Valley gets his way and has J.D. Vance whispering in the ear of Donald Trump about government regulation uh, or the, the elimination of government regulation as it pertains to uh, emerging corporations? I think it's going to happen. If he wins or takes power again, it will happen. Um, the oligarchs, the conspiracy of uh, robber barons uh, will have tremendous power because they will have influence with him. He will owe them. Vance will owe them. Vance already owes them big time. He'll owe them even more uh, if he becomes vice president or possibly president. Um, so they will own the, the government and the government will, will will be a different kind of government. What can I say? You know, this reminds me of what happened in uh, uh, Venezuela with, with Maduro. Um, you know, you, you had this uh, huge majority in a phony vote. And he emerges and says, congratulate me, I just won the vote. And all the people in the street are saying, no, it was the other way around. You lost the vote and you phonied it up. This, this was a, a fixed election. And uh, furthermore, people have been disappearing uh, they've been charged with crimes. The government is going after anyone who opposes him. Um, and that, that is the kind of thing that's going to happen here. We're going to be living in an autocracy, living in a fascism. 
That's what he's promising us, and I believe that. Well, Venezuela, be it Venezuela, uh, Chile, Argentina back in the 70s, uh, this is standard operational procedure. Uh, I, I, I'm going to say I've elected no matter what, and if I hear any criticism, uh, you're going to jail. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention Russia in that, in that list. Um, that's just standard, standard uh, the way things are. Uh, yeah, we're not used to it. Happened. Yes. And look what happened to those countries. They're, you know, what, what is uh, Trump's word for it? Shitholes? Um, you know, they're, they're terrible economics, terrible social policy, gangs, violence. They're really in terrible shape, every one of them that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, there are very few countries in Latin America that actually work as democracies, as viable economies. And so if you let a fascist like this get in charge on a phony election, uh, beware that, that it goes all in the same direction as these Latin American countries have gone. You know, I'm going to take a left turn here and divert off the conversation just a little bit because um, I read an article about uh, Putin making an appeal to all families, all women, that you should be having as many children as possible um, because the birth rate is not the birth rate, but um, eligible men to fight the wars and uh, populate the country is declining rapidly. And not to mention the mass exodus of brain power and wealth and males of a certain age to get out of Russia due to the Ukraine war. So I think it's, uh, it's rather um, amazing that Putin now is placing a heavy emphasis on the value of women having as many children as possible, uh, getting out of the workplace and putting them back in the homes where they can't be seen, can't be heard. Uh, gee, doesn't that sound like make America great again? It takes 15 or 20 years for that to play out. Right, no, but uh, it's, it's interesting that he's placing a heavy emphasis on this right now in the midst of a war where the uh, obvious answer is, why would I want to have more children so you could put them on the front lines for slaughter? Well, I heard the other day that, in fact, um, he was inviting Indians to come from India, speak of Indians, um, and to join the Russian economy because they needed people. And so they came to Russia, and then he conscripted them into the army, where a number of them have died fighting Ukraine. Um, not because they wanted to, but because they have got in this mousetrap with, come and have a job, we need yeah. you. And so, you know, this is this is the word of a guy who lies all day. We know that. Uh, and, and, and look what happened. All right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this one up. We've run out of time. Uh, Jay, your final thoughts on uh, Peter Thiel's and Silicon Valley's uh, efforts to get their wonder boy uh, put in the administration. It seems like they're successful. Uh, d does their plan work? Uh, your final thoughts. Well, uh, I think he, he very well may step on his own toes and Trump may have to you know, get rid of him. But uh, I, that would be bad for Trump if he had to do that. I think he's kind of committed. It would hurt him to get rid of Vance. But the um, the oligarchs must be stopped. It's really outrageous what they are doing, and it's visible. And, and you know, the choices are, well, Harris has to go after the wealthy, the 1%, including those guys. And she has to, you know, bring some responsibility to the tech industry and, and the billionaire club. Um, at the same time, we, the, the public, we have to do our part. So I would never buy a Tesla, for example, ever, ever, ever. I'd never buy any product from that company. I, I applaud the Chinese for giving him such a hard time on manufacturing Teslas in China. Um, and we can, we can vote, you know, with our purchase. We can vote with our pocketbooks, and we should. Once they are outed as members of this conspiracy, and I hope the press does that, we should vote against them in every way we can. Great words. Thank you very much. My co-host, Jay Fidel. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And why don't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. <laughs>